people are still trickling in. Sarah Turner, whenever you're ready, I think we can go ahead and begin, even though we have people still coming in. We should be good to go. We are recording, and I believe the uh, presentation is up. Great. Wonderful. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Meeks, and I'm the executive director of the Docs with Disabilities Initiative. I'm also an associate professor of learning health sciences and family medicine at the University of Michigan. Go Blue. I want to welcome all of you to the third in this three-part series of webinars. This webinar is designed to assist disability resource professionals, or as we lovingly refer to them, our DRPs, and other medical school staff and faculty who are supporting students as they navigate the National Board of Medical Examiners process for requesting accommodation. As always, we are grateful to our partners and our volunteers who make this work possible, including our Docs with Disabilities Access and Medicine team and the University of Michigan Center for Disability Health and Wellness. Before we begin, Jan, Ellen, and I want to take a moment to recognize the horrific events happening in the world right now. We have all personally been impacted by these events of the last few weeks, and really we have all collectively been impacted by the events of the last few years. We did not feel comfortable beginning any conversation today without acknowledging the effect that this is having on our community, including many of you. At a time where people are suffering and so much division is present in our world, we ask that you take a moment to check on your colleagues, your friends, and your community. We recommend leaning into kindness, providing grace for those who are struggling just to get through the day. And we as a group will continuously provide space for people to feel the effects of what's happening. And we will acknowledge these events and support our colleagues in whatever manner is needed for them. As a reminder, this series is available on our YouTube page. And the best way to stay current with all Docs with Disabilities Initiative events is to subscribe to our website and our YouTube page. You'll be updated on all events and postings of videos, including this video webinar three. And with that, I will turn it over to Ellen. Hello. I'm Ellen Kaplan. I'm the Assistant Director of Student Disability Services and the Learning Specialist at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. I originated the role of the Learning Specialist at Johns Hopkins and soon after took over the role um, as the uh, Disability Coordinator. My background is in special education and education advocacy, and as well as supporting learners with executive function and ADHD difficulties. We'd like to offer a brief disclaimer for the series. The webinar is intended to provide general information about applying accommodations on the USMLE step exams. The authors of this guide are not experts in the National Board of Medical Examiners or the NBME process. We defer to the NBME for official guidance on the process as they evaluate and determine accommodations for the step one, two, and three exams. This document offers a supplement for students and DRPs to unpack the hidden curriculum of this process based on our collective experience supporting students to request accommodation on high stake exams. All 
our equity you statement. You've already met Lisa and Ellen. And for those of you I've not had the pleasure to meet, I'm Jan Sarantino, and I'm currently an independent higher education consultant, and I assist schools with health science programs and medical schools with the USMLE uh, and medical students with the USMLE application process. But in my former life, I was the director of the University of California, Irvine Disability Center. Well, before we begin, we wanna ask schools to consider the inequities in this process and the need to um, provide greater support. We continue to remain concerned about the inequities that exist prior to medical education. For example, access to specialists, diagnoses, and high quality documentation, financial and educational resources for early identification for, of disability and supportive intervention, and in the provision of accommodations for education and high stakes exam, exams and medical training. We recognize that these inequities are disproportionately affecting students of color, those that are first generation to college, those from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds, those students who enter medicine disadvantaged by myriad structural and cultural barriers that persist throughout their medical education. Our hope is that this guide it will provide DRPs and medical school leadership one level of support for their trainees. We encourage medical school leaders and DRPs to take seriously the barriers imposed by an inherently privileged process and to provide students the maximum level of support possible. This support will increase students' chances of full and equitable equitable access to the exam and decrease the intense burden on students with disabilities who already are balancing personal, family, social health, and academic priorities. Ellen? Let's talk a little bit about the personal statement. As you know, the NBME requires a personal statement as part of the accommodation request process. Drafting and finalizing the personal statement is often the most time consuming part of the application process and can be one of the most critical and compelling parts of the request. This is the student's only opportunity to share their personal experience living with a disability. Though it's called the personal statement, this submission is much different than a typical personal statement. The personal statement is unique and should focus on areas of difficulties rather than strengths. It is not the time to talk about how well one has been doing. Instead, students will need to highlight what activities are difficult, how they manage these difficulties, and ongoing challenges across multiple domains of their life. The NBME guidance on the personal statement states this, attach a signed and dated personal statement describing your impairments and their impact on daily life. Narratives should not be confined to standardized test performance. The personal statement is your opportunity to tell us how your physical or mental impairments substantially limit your current functioning in a major life activity. In your own words, discuss how your impairments would interfere with your access to the relevant USMLE step and how the specific accommodations you are requesting will alleviate this impact. So the role of the DRP is that the, they help the student with the personal statements because it is their only opportunity to contextualize their disability and their personal experiences and within the examination. It is a critical element of their packet and often a source of great personal distress. Providing concrete guidance to students and support in editing 
increases their chances that the student's application will be understood and reflect the level of detail needed to meet the NBME standards. Thanks, Ellen. As we've stated before in our webinar series, we have been absolutely blessed to have the NBME respond to some of your most pressing questions. Here's one example. The question reads, what is the number one thing you think or number one thing you feel, sorry, most individuals applying for accommodations are not aware of, but should be. And the NBME responded that examinees should be aware that they do not need to provide a large vol volume of documents in order to have accommodation requests approved. Examinees and their evaluating slash treating professionals should focus on the information and documentation that is relevant to the examinee's request. For example, an extremely long personal statement is not necessary. A relatively short personal statement that conveys specific relevant information, including symptoms and functional limitations relative to taking a standardized exam, such as the USMLE, is much more helpful than a long personal statement that does not provide this information and hopefully takes less time for the examinee to prepare. Additionally, examinees are not required to submit all of the documents listed in the NBME's guidelines, but only those documents that are relevant Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, only those documents that are relevant, uh, sorry, to their diagnosed disorder. Relevant clinical documentation and objective documentation are informative and helpful in our review. Letters from individuals who have not evaluated or treated the examinee or who have worked with or observed the examinee on a regular basis in a relevant area are not always helpful. And preparing these types of letters may cause unnecessary work for the examinees and the letter writers. <clears throat> oh dear, thank you, Lisa. Um, I think what the um, NBME is trying to say is that, um, uh, now that I found my place again, oh dear, it keeps popping. What is going on? Um, uh, that is, they're stressing that letters that do not provide substantive information or data are unnecessary. In fact, in some ways, providing just the right amount of information is best. And as the MBME points out, a more efficient way to approach this process. Unfortunately, to try and justify the need for accommodations, students sometimes try to take the kitchen sink approach to the application and to the personal statement. In this instance, they submit several pages to document everything that has ever happened to them in their life with the goal of proving worthiness. This is sometimes fueled by the belief that no one gets accommodations, but this is not necessary. Great, I agree. <laughs> Indeed, providing too little, or too little documentation can under support your application while providing too much documentation, including letters from parents, support from teachers that don't have substantive value. For example, Amy's a wonderful student who deserves the accommodations. These types of things are unlikely to help and may actually delay the accommodation because it necessitates additional time to review. Instead, like Goldilocks, students should aim for the just right category. Provide enough background to substantiate your status as a person with a disability and no more. You should make a succinct and clear argument for the accommodation need, grounding each request in your documentation. In some cases, students' personal statements have actually worked against them, with students falling into a few traps that we'll discuss today. 
So students should focus on an area of difficulty rather than strengths. And you DRPs out there, you may need to explain why this is necessary. Students with disabilities, in fact, are often taught to emphasize their strengths when speaking about themselves. However, in an NBME personal statement, this can work against the student. The personal statement requires that the student only highlight their academic difficulties and clearly explain any mechanisms behind their success. Students must focus on the disability and its impact. I cannot stress this enough. Unlike anything that your students have ever done, this is going to be difficult. This is a deficit-based statement. We know this may feel counterintuitive and can be emotionally challenging to write. The role of the DRP is to support the student through this process discuss the personal statement, and provide meaningful feedback. While the DRPs should not provide extensive editing, they should work with students to help them best articulate their needs and help them avoid the most common issues with the personal statement. This is why in webinar one, we pointed out how important it is to start early. This process can be very emotional for some. This process can also be very triggering for some students. Pulling out old emotions after they have reviewed all of their documentation and previous performance indicators. Well, starting early allows students also to engage in supports like meeting with therapists, hanging out with friends or enjoying the outdoors, engaging in hobbies. And increasing some of these supports can help mitigate the impact of the process on the student's well-being. For these reasons, students, DRPs, should work with students to identify the barriers that exist because of the format and the structure of the exam in interaction with the student's disabilities. The structure of the exam was detailed uh, in webinar one, and you did a great job. But for example, the exam is very long. It's about eight hours, and students who experience cognitive fatigue after four hours of intense study um, due to their disability, may need to ask for accommodations due to the length of the exam. The length may actually be the barrier. However, the exam is also administered on a computer. And if the disability impacts the student's ability to read text on screen, then the format and delivery of the exam might actually be the barrier. Finally, if a student has difficulty reading or writing, processing information within strict time limits, the time limit of the exam may be the barrier. Once the student understands the barriers that the exam poses, the DRP and the student can work together to determine what accommodations are truly necessary. The accommodations the students utilized in the past may or may not apply to this particular setting. It really depends on whether and how there are barriers to this exam. But the personal statement should outline this very, very clearly for the NBME. The personal statement will always start with the student describing the nature of the disability. From there, a history of the accommodations used across academic settings is needed. This may go all the way back to elementary school or for those newly diagnosed, you should include college or medical school. It is most important to provide the history of accommodations on scholastic exams, such as the PSAT, ACT or SAT, MCAT or other high stake exams. There are also instances where accommodations may have been provided in the workplace. Things such as hybrid work options, dictation or screen readers should not be overlooked. For some students, informal accommodations may have been provided. Students who have been homeschooled could have had their learning tailored to their individual needs or maybe attended a college where there were no timed exams. These small details illuminate important facts about the circumstances around a student's performance. The student should provide specifics about any challenges on exams or when the strategies or supports were not sufficient. 
it is imperative to highlight the need for the request and contextualize this in the student's prior experiences. When writing the personal statement, it's important to have the student clearly explain the nature of the disability and include a description of the day-to-day -day impact the disability has had on the student's life, not just the impact on the academic testing scenario. Oops, sorry, um, or taking exams. They should consider the impact on interpersonal relationships, employment, the need to withdraw from courses because of an unaccommodated disability, their personal organization systems, their driving record, their financial management ways, and et cetera. To aid students in understanding how to approach the personal statement, the new guide provides personal statement prompts. Great. So when I was working as a DRP, I liked to think of this as a math equation. It's essential that the student connect the disability to the related barriers to the exam to how the accommodations will reduce or eliminate these barriers. The burden of proof, remember, and requesting accommodation is on the student. The student needs to be very clear about the barriers posed by the test and the anticipated outcome if the accommodation is not in place. And the barrier must clearly connect to a student's disability and be substantiated by disability documentation. So A, functional limitation, plus B, barrier on the exam, equals C, accommodation need. Students also need to pay close attention to the language used to describe the accommodation needs. The personal statement should not reflect their accommodation request as a preference for an accommodation, which is one of the things that has been detrimental to students in the past, but rather they should emphasize that this is a need for this accommodation. The student must explain why it's necessary to ensure equitable access to the exam. For example, Students should not say things like, I would do better with, or to ensure my success. Indeed, accommodations are not designed to ensure success. They are designed to ensure access. They should also avoid using phrases like learning differences or state that they've overcome their disability, as the MBME really is only interested in disabilities that require accommodation. Remember, writing the personal statement is difficult. Be sure to refer your student back to the guide for prompts, outlines, and topics that may be relevant to support their case. Thanks, Lisa. Well, let's consider how a student might communicate their disability-related impact and needs in the personal statement. Let's look at a student who experiences considerable barriers due to the symptoms of anxiety during high pressure situations. Hmm. This is what one student wrote in their personal statement. When I am under considerable pressure, that is interviews, exams, quizzes, new social settings, the symptoms of my anxiety are exacerbated. The physical symptoms, tachycardia, diaphoresis, and GI upset, of my anxiety impair my functioning. In these moments, I need to employ deep breathing exercises. I often need to change shirts as I am literally drenched during these attacks. As well, during times of considerable pressure, I am struck with the need to use the restroom for extended periods of time. I work to reduce the impact of these symptoms in several ways. For example, I pack an extra shirt to change into. I utilize rescue medication, 0.5 milligrams of Ativan, which often reduces the physical symptoms, but it causes delayed cognition. And I limit my food intake to minimize GI impact, but I cannot eliminate the symptoms. To have sufficient time to manage my symptoms through self-talk, using the restroom and taking medication, I require additional time and additional breaks, 
Without these accommodations, I need to utilize valuable exam time to mitigate the symptoms and will not have access to all the questions on the exam. Under these conditions, I will not be able to demonstrate my medical knowledge. What if performance was significantly improved after accommodations were approved? Students may wish to consider a compare contrast approach, that is comprehensions before and after receiving accommodations, especially if they were observed by faculty and if there are um, objective measures to verify this change like pre and post assessments. Avoid explaining successes unless they are a result of uh, um, accommodations being implemented. So let's look at what this student wrote. Oh no, um, but what if a student is newly diagnosed? In webinar one, you heard Grace Cliver discuss the fallacy that newly diagnosed students do not get accommodations on MBME. We know this is not true and they do get accommodations, but you'll need to provide context and support the need. MBME needs a clear rationale or a description. That is, the student needs to address why they need accommodations when they never had them before on high stakes exams, such as the SAT, GRE, or MCAT. Students may need to recreate some aspects of their history if the diagnosis could have been diagnosed earlier. What are the circumstances of their upbringing or early education that can help MBME understand their late diagnosis? For example, did parents provide years of additional tutoring? Did the student receive informal accommodations from their teachers? For example, did the teachers let them do assignments over again or provide unofficial extra time? Were they in a program that allowed unlimited time? Is disability in itself, um, the diagnosis opposed by their parents or by their culture? Is the diagnosis one that occurs at their developmental age? For example, uh, some psychological diagnosis like trauma or bipolar or new physical or mental conditions. Um, is the student a first generation or limited income without access to testing for a disability? Lisa? Thanks, Jan. Many students simply stated that they have always been able to get by in their undergraduate just by watching lectures, observing, or listening. However, the transition to medical school presents more complex, nuanced issues and the volume at speed, volume and speed at which students need to learn is unlike anything they've ever experienced before. So once they hit medical school, the, where the terminology is complex and the pace is fast and unforgiving and reading is a necessity, they have been unable to compensate using their traditional workarounds. Many In many cases, they have uncovered a latent learning disability. This is not uncommon. They just need to articulate this to the MBME. So again, let's look at um, an example. Um, in this case, we have someone who's newly diagnosed during medical school. And this student wrote, in medical school, when I was tested under time conditions, I was almost always fail. See the note from XYZ letter of support. I was finally provided with 50% extended time as a temporary accommodation. The additional time allowed me to fully read absorb, comprehend, and respond to all the questions. Once this change was made, I was able to finish all exams with very few errors. See printout of test scores in courses A, B, C, pre and post accommodation. I was then formally tested. See neuropsych from 922, reading fluency in the 18th percentile and comprehension in the 16th percentile and diagnosed with a reading disability. 
Together, this supports my need for a combination of 50% time on an exam with significant reading in both the question stems and potential answers. Ellen? As you can see, the student provided relevant information, including specific scores from the test to support the need for the accommodation request. But what if a student wasn't provided accommodations in undergrad? Let's take a look at an example. I attended a liberal arts college where the honor code dictated testing conditions. Students were not held to a time limit nor were tests proctored. In, the, in these situations, I was able to take my time reading the questions in their entirety without testing protocols that might prompt additional anxiety, such as constantly being watched or monitored or feeling like the proctor was waiting for me to finish. Here, I was always the last student to finish the exam. See the note from professor supporting this. And I was testing under very supportive, non-anxiety provoking conditions. For these reasons, I was able to thrive in undergrad and my need for accommodation was met via structural conditions that posed no barriers. Thanks, Ellen. So you can see throughout these examples that students are supporting their statements with documentation. One big thing that students are being asked to support or explain is why they didn't have accommodations or request them on the MCAT, especially if their MCAT scores were in the superior range. In this example, the student explains the nuance of his scores and why he was able to be successful on the MCAT, but why he predicts that he'll struggle with step one. Given that I was unaware of my disability and only knew that reading took me longer, I did not seek accommodations on the MCAT. Although I performed well, you'll note significant discrepancies between the critical analysis and reading section, the CAR section, that requires students to read a passage, process and interpret information and answer the question about the passage versus the more straightforward science sections. On the CAR section of the MCAT, I performed considerably less well. Additionally, the MCAT tests wrote information, mostly memorized and easy to identify. It does not require the in-depth understanding of human physiology, pathophysiology, pharmacology, and treatment paradigms, and does not require the associated thinking and processing levels that are needed for the step one exam. There are many cases where a student has a long history of accommodation. However, you cannot rest on your laurels or rest on this fact. You must still build a solid argument. Here is an example of a student beginning their personal statement and acknowledging and documenting their history, but also the current need for accommodation. I have a long history of dyslexia that has impaired my ability to complete high stakes tests under time conditions. Functionally, my condition results in slowed reading and processing, requiring me to reread re re -read passages multiple times to fully comprehend material. As well, my ability to read in a timely manner is impaired, as noted in my neuropsychological report dated 1222. My reading fluency remains highly impaired compared to the average person's standard at the seventh percentile, citing the test and the standard score percentile. My step one exam requires considerable reading for comprehension. Both question stems and the multiple choice answers. Therefore, the test presents considerable barriers given my disability and functional limitations. These barriers necessitate the provision of additional time, 50%, to fully read, comprehend, and respond to written questions. So let's discuss about those who have a well-established history of accommodations. 
So when you're applying for testing accommodations on the MBME exam, you're going to, I need to try that again. I'm applying for testing accommodations on the NBME step one exam to achieve equal access to the exam so that my scores are representative of my ability. I have a significant learning disability first diagnosed in fifth grade by Dr. Feelgood. I was subsequently reevaluated twice, first in 12th grade by Dr. Happyface, licensed school psychologist, then by Dr. What's It Who's It at the age of 24. I have a long history of accommodations in college, my post bac program, and now in medical school. As well, I have received accommodations on all standardized high stake exams to date, including SAT, ACT, GRE, and the MCAT. This letter serves as my account of these accommodations and assessments, as well as a narrative about how my disability currently impacts my functioning, which underscore the significance of my learning disability and its relevance in a timed, standardized, reading intensive testing situation. I've enclosed extensive documentation, see attached, to substantiate my accommodation requests. And now let's think about the student who has a history of disability and its impact. So this student writes, an initial psychological evaluation by Dr. Feelgood in October of 2000, the beginning of my sixth grade year, identified the cause of my slow reading and difficulty with writing and how I was limited under time conditions. Insert commentary from report. I was so highly impaired, I was unable to complete sixth grade math, withdrew from my school, and began a year-long independent study focused on project-based learning. The results of the shift of in modalities were clear at were clear working at my own pace and completing projects instead of regular exams um, was allowed me to reach my full potential as a student. At an early age, my parents and teachers recognized that it was necessary to accommodate my learning disabilities through an adapted educational approach. Danger, Will Rogers. We need to talk about some things. There are a few warnings to assist the learner. Make sure the student stays grounded in the facts. Encourage them not to present an emotional argument. These are rarely helpful. The student is not an attorney. Discourage them from including a ton of legal language in their personal statements. Remind the student that this is not a novel. Don't be overly flowery and keep it concise and specific. We recommend about three pages. Thanks, Ellen. I, I want to super co-sign on that slide in particular. So the greatest gift a DRP can give a student is focus and feedback. Remove any unnecessary commentary and keep the student focused on the history and the equation model that I gave you earlier. Remove any non or remove any non necessary legal language and all those emotional pleas. I know it's difficult. Sometimes it's helpful to write it out, but they shouldn't be part of the statement. The student is a student with a disability, and they have a right to these accommodations. So I want you to think of this as a five paragraph approach to building your argument. This should take all of us back to freshman composition. You open with a beginning paragraph, followed by your first statement. You are a person with a disability. And as you see in this, in this slide, three supporting pieces of documentation to, to back up your statement. Then you go into showing or communicating that you are a person that has functional limitations. Again, three statements, three pieces of documentation to support that statement. And then finally, you provide the information about needing or the necessity of accommodations on this exam examination and provide supporting documentation. After all of this, you write one conclusion, conclusion statement about why you are not able to complete this exam without the accommodations, why there would be barriers in place. Ellen? Thank you, Lisa. 
Okay, now before we go to the question and answer, we want to cover another question posed to the NBME. The question is, can students call the NBME Disability Services with questions or to consult on the best method to navigate the process, or does it need to be a school official? So this is a great question we often get. The Thanks NBME, for all the submissions, by the way. Yeah, the, the NBME provided us with this response. Yes, examinees can call or email the NBME Disability Services at any time with any questions they may have regarding the testing accommodation process. During peak periods, typically January through April, email may be more effective than a phone call. If an examinee leaves a voicemail, the NBME will respond as quickly as it can within the course of a normal business day. NBME's contact information is on the testing accommodation request form, and the team can also be reached through the Contact Us feature on their website, www.usmle.org backslash contact hyphen US. Please note that while examinees are welcome to and frequently do contact the NBME Disability Services with questions, we are not able to provide information on what specific documentation a given examinee needs to submit as it varies for each individual. And there is not one piece of documentation that will guarantee approval. Thanks, Ellen. Okay, so we come to the end of webinar three for this series. We do encourage you, um, and we hope that this series has empowered you to contact the USMLE um, and MBME. They are partners in this process for you. And as we've stated multiple times, they are the expert in this space. We are also so proud to bring you the new guide. The new guide is currently at BrailleWorks getting all of the accessibility checks so that it is available and readable for everyone. It will be posted no later than October 27th, along with all of the appendices. I think there are five or six appendices in, um, in some, and it will be available on the website uh, www.docswithdisabilities.org slash USMLE dash accommodations dash guide. The quickest way, as I mentioned before, to access this guide is to go ahead and sign up on our website um, to receive our blog posts and updates. We'll have our, our very first newsletter coming out soon. Ellen, thanks. Um, one of the things that I that brings me so much joy is working with so many amazing DRPs in this space who have given their time and talents and have volunteered to create this amazing resource for you. So I wanted to take a second and thank them by name. Nira Jane, uh, my partner in crime for almost a decade. Sarah Triano, who is also the director of our Access and Medicine group and who did uh, Herculean efforts to bring this guide to everyone and keeping us all very organized. Thank you so much, Sarah, for everything you do. Sue Nam, Grace Clifford, Rebecca Gillier, uh, Jan Sarantino, Ellen Kaplan, and Charlotte O'Connor. I also want to acknowledge the careful review and feedback of many of our colleagues and some students, including Riley Betchkel, uh, Zainoub Danani, Charlie Ferreri, Kara James, Matt Sullivan, and Tom Webb. Thank you so much for everything that you did and the important things that you pointed out through the review of this document. And finally, you can find all of our resources and activities at docswithdisabilities.org. Um, on YouTube, please subscribe at Docs with Disabilities Initiative. And on Twitter, I refuse to call it X at Docs with. And on Instagram, and thank you to all the students running our Instagram um, handle, including Zoe Martin Lockhart at Docs with Disabilities. So now we are ready for questions. And I know we did a lot of questions at the beginning. And so can you please restate the suggested five paragraphs? Ellen, would you mind going back to that picture of the, uh, at first we thought this is so, you need to make it digestible 
to the MBME. And so if you think about it as the hamburger, the, the five paragraph essay, this is really what you were taught in freshman composition is that you do an introductory paragraph, which essentially says, this is the argument I'm about to make. Um, and why I believe it's true. And then the conclusion paragraph, which is this is the argument I've made and I've proven my points. And in between those are three, there can be four or five, depending on what your student needs. But there are points that you are making, essentially arguments that you are making um, about yourself as a person with a disability, about the fact that you have functional limitations, and about the fact that those functional limitations are connected to barriers to the NBME um, step one, step two, or step three exam. And the supports in a five paragraph essay, you would provide supports um, for your statements, right? You don't just make a statement and that makes it true. You have to provide evidence or support. And so if you think about it this way, it may be easier for students to di digest this model. And as you saw in our examples, the individuals, and these came from actual statements, um, actual successful arguments too, uh, the NBME, you'll see that students were backing up their statements with documentation and not just with documentation, like see this neuropsych, but they were presenting themselves as people with disabilities um, that were impaired uh, against the average person's standard. And here is why my Fluency is in the seventh percentile on the Woodcock Johnson, et cetera, et cetera. So providing that level of detail and support. So I hope that answers your question. Lisa, we have another question that says, in utilizing the five paragraph approach, can you repeat the length of the recommendation um, yeah. of the personal statement? Sure. So I fully agree. And in my experience, I've, I've had years and years and years of supporting students at really high levels of success. Like I want to say 98%. And those 2% are generally students that I tell you will not get approved, but I will not not support you if you will. Um, so in my professional experience, I agree with the National Board of Medical Educators that it is it is not helpful to provide superfluous information or please. Um, and if you think about just streamlining and being very succinct and providing the evidence and the statements, we recommend about three pages. That should suffice for most students. If you have an incredibly complicated case, it may be that you need to explain a little bit more and that might take you into four pages. But in my experience, years of experience, it is not helpful to submit large, large letters of, of pleas and personal statements. We have another question that I will answer because I am also a learning specialist. So the question says, I, a learning specialist, plan to write a letter of support. Oops, I lost the question. Um, plan to write a, a letter of support for a student I've worked with closely. Will there be guidance on these letters in the new guide or tips you can offer? So the first thing is, yes, there is guidance. And I would follow the guidance that any DRP would use to help support uh, that letter. Um, remember that any letter of support really needs to provide the data as to why the student's request is relevant. So as a learning specialist, one thing I do is I note the types of support that I provide the student that also go with the accommodation to make sure that they can see that we are really doing everything we can to support this student. Something else you might wanna do is if you have access to, especially if we're talking about timed assessments and how long they're, they've taken against the non-accommodated group, that's another piece of data where we could say, I've worked with the student to, and I've seen from these tests, here is how long they've taken compared to their non-accommodated peers, which is why the accommodation of extended time is essential. One of the things, if I could ask, we have some behind the scenes partners. Um, we were all supporting each other on our various webinars. So Sarah or Grace, if one of you is able to put in the chat and then our Sarah Turner can send it out to everyone, um, the link to the book 
the Equal Access book. The Equal Access book is now completely free. And I believe it's chapter six is high stakes exams. And in there, we actually have kind of a formula for writing a letter of support. And I agree, Ellen, I would just follow those same guidelines, but provide absolute objective um, documentation. And if you can send in test scores, so as part of your PDF letter of support, if you can show test scores, um, differences when a student was accommodated. I actually watched all of my students take their exams. I personally proctored all of the exams when I was at UCSF. So I could actually observe the testing conditions and the kind of the symptoms of the student and their needs during testing and could speak to this. So I would definitely include that. But if, if somebody could get that book link out, I think that would be very helpful to know that there are other resources that are currently available. Yep. So Elise, I added that to the Q&A to Chelsea's question. Oh. So the link to the guides in there as well. Thank you, Sarah. We have another question. Many individuals in medical school with non-apparent disabilities perform relatively well compared to most people on standard psychoeducational assessments. Any su suggestions for additional testing, such as neuropsych, that can tease out information in the presence of high intelligence and generally average or above average academic skills? This often comes up with the students with ADHD. Thanks for all the amazing work your group does. Well, thank you so much for saying that we work. It's such a, it's such an amazing group of individuals that work really hard to try to bring you all of these resources. Um, yes. So while some people believe a neuropsych is necessary for ADHD, there's something called um, a CPT test, a computerized uh, processing test, which actually measures your omissions and commissions as an individual with ADHD. So it's measuring your attention and it provides uh, objective information. Those tests, I used to do them in private practice. They're far less expensive. And in the context, and this is really important, in the context of a full evaluation by a psychiatrist or a psychologist, um, they can be very helpful. Outside of that, to just have that as an objective measure isn't super helpful because you need that um, clinical impression by the the provider, but that would be my my biggest recommendation for objective information. Okay, we have another question. Would you caution against statements in the conclusion in the conclusion paragraph elaborating on how providing reasonable accommodations to students with disabilities will in turn diversify the pool of healthcare professionals, change the landscape of patient care, et cetera. So Sarah is about to write an answer to that. So please look in the Q&A for that. Yeah. And I'll just say, this is part of the emotional plea. Um, the job of the MBME is to protect the public through making sure that everyone has the requisite uh, competencies and skills to be able to go out into the workforce. And while we all uh, desire to diversify the workforce, that's, that is not their, their first line goal. So I don't think that it would be helpful. Our next question is, are the NBME and USMLE private organization or partnered with the government? Do they still rely on federal funding for anything? I believe um, I want to say if I were a betting person, I would bet 90%. They are private organizations and do not rely on the government for, for anything. I, I think I know where that question is going. Um, and I applaud the creative thinking, but my, my gut, and I don't know this for sure, but my gut is that these are wholly private organizations that do not have any federal funding. Okay. But that is a question you could ask the, the MBME. That's a yeah, perfect yeah. question to send the MBME. In fact, we're going to send a, a list of questions to the MBME, the most, the the kind of the questions that rose up as, as the most um, salient questions from this series and ask them to um, think about how they might answer those for the general public and maybe a Q&A, FAQ, something like that. Okay. And we have a question about a student who has a new diagnosis in medical school post taking step one. 
-hmm. I worked with a student who began experiencing double vision, blurry vision as a result of frequent screen exposure. The student began working with different providers to get a diagnosis, but tests have been inconclusive thus far. They managed to pass step one, but will be applying for accommodations for step two. The student has no issue prior and no accommodations. As a learning specialist, what type of data can be provided in a support letter? So I can start and I hope my colleagues will jump in. So part of this is that we are going to need to have some medical documentation that substantiates a disability that has the need for accommodations. Without that, it would be more difficult to get those accommodations. One thing that I think we can we can do is start to collect that data about what type of impact the, you know, as you saw in those examples, when I look at the screen for X amount of time, this is what happens. You know, most of my work is on a computer, therefore it takes me longer because these things happen. And at least start your data log. Lisa or Jan, do you have other things to add to that? I do. I'm just looking on my computer for the actual documentation of what it's called. Um, I have I a couple of have students this. who have that issue. Um, I'm just trying okay. to look at it Looking, quick. I just want to briefly say, and thank you. I, uh, speaking of low vision, I, I, I have some visual disability. I have some visual issues that are a secondary to my disability. And so it makes it very difficult for me to read. I have some things blown up, but I over, I overlooked because it was in very small font, a very important person, uh, Aggie McCrane at Northwestern, who also reviewed our document. And so I just want to thank her. And Aggie has actually been a rock star. Many of these people are involved in our access and medicine group and um, have been wonderful. So I'm so sorry, Aggie, you know how much I love you. I would never overlook you. Um, and thank you uh, to somebody for pointing that out. It is absolutely a product of my vision. I have ordered a very expensive bottles of wine thinking that they were a lot cheaper. And so I've learned my lesson, even with glasses though, I need to double check and have my husband read a lot of things. Okay, so there's a, a question really quickly, Jan, why you're still working on that about the necessity for repeating evaluations. This is such a tricky one and I'm so glad that you asked this. Um, if somebody is on the cusp of that three years, if it were my student and we were planning in plenty of time, I would submit that documentation. If it's for a disability that's lifelong where you have tons of documentation, the tests have been repeated multiple times. You know, in general, intelligence tests using adult-based intelligence tests are not going to vary. They shouldn't vary, right? Intelligence is a, is a pretty stable characteristic. So we, I would encourage you not to go through the timing and the, and the money for that. I think the MBME's response is probably going to be, you know, go ahead and apply. And if we feel we need it for verification, we'll ask for it. So that's one of those things where you would just have to be really, really organized and you would have to apply early. This may, the consequence on the extending end may be that uh, you get your approval very early and you have a window that doesn't work for you now. So you may need to extend that window, which you can do. There is a small fee, um, but you can do that. One other thing is when you have your students who come in at year one and they are requesting accommodations, one thing that I always do is I go over all of their documentation to see when it was done and what additional things they might need that we know the NBME looks for, because that gives them plenty of time to get those things in order. Um, sometimes students might need to work with financial aid to help with those testing um, re, uh, expenses. So as a rule of thumb, really carefully go through the documentation your first year students provide to you to make sure that you have enough time for them to get what they need. Awesome. And we are at time. Speaking of time, we want to thank you so much, Ellen, if you don't mind fast forwarding to those links again. Um, we had hoped to launch the, the guide today, but it will be next week. And so if you, if you already subscribe to us, you know, you get these emails. We try not to do it often. We don't want to flood your email, but we try to give you important information like these recordings. Um, but we, 
we anticipate having it up before the 27th, so it could be earlier, um, but it will be up. And the good news is it will be certified and fully accessible. And it's really important to us as a community that everyone was able to learn it. One of the, or able to read it, one of the big things for us um, that was also important was to stop and ask students who would be utilizing this, one of the consumers of this information to go through this. And so we're really grateful to those students who did that. And we are ever so grateful to everyone who reviews the project or reviewed this project. And as always, thank you so much for all the hard work that you do in the trenches. We will be here behind the scenes supporting you. Look for our next set of resources to come out. They're coming out in the next few weeks. And again, we appreciate your time and your talents and your hard work. And be nice to each other. Be so kind, ever so kind in the next few weeks. Everyone is struggling. So any extra effort and grace is always appreciated. Thank you so much.